Welcome. This is Kathy Crossway. I am the Deputy Director for the Sacramento Public Library. And thank you so much for joining us today for a special Authors Uncovered event uh, presented by the Sacramento Public Library. Um, we're very pleased to host author Janet Skeslin Charles for a conversation about her latest book, The Paris Library. Based on a true World War II story of the heroic librarians of the American Library in Paris, it's an unforgettable story of friendship, family, and the power of literature to bring us together. Of course, as a library, we're very excited about this. Um, and it's such an intriguing book. I know you're going to love it, and you're going to love the conversation. Um, Janet Skeslin Charles is the award-winning author of Moonlight in Odessa, which was published in 10 languages. Janet first became interested in the incredible true story of the librarians who stood up to the Nazi book protector when she worked as the programs manager at the American Library in Paris. Our commitment to creating opportunities for our community is stronger than ever. Whether it's bringing one-of-a-kind author experience, such as Authors Uncovered, we offer various virtual programs for all ages, from story times and book clubs to teen programming and English conversation groups. You can now visit 21 library locations with limited occupancy. The public is able to visit and browse any of the reopened locations and can browse up to one hour. Patrons can continue to use curbside at most locations and make one hour computer appointments at select locations. So before we get started, a few items. You may pose a question using the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We'll reserve some time at the end of the program to address some of the questions. If you post in the chat, your comments will be public. We ask that you keep the conversation civil and respectful. Anyone violating this code of conduct will be blocked. A recording is being made and will be made available on our website, saclibrary.org later this week. So keep in mind, even if you have read the book, you can get the, the Paris Library at Underground Books. And it's a signed copy when you purchase it from Underground Books. And we'll be posting that link in the chat as well. But you can also find it on our website at saclibrary.org. And also at the library, we have the book in print, in large print, ebooks and audiobooks. So all is available on our card catalog for all of our card holders, which I'm hoping all of you do have a library card. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't thank our partners at Atria Books, an imprint of Simon & Schuster for bringing this wonderful opportunity to Sacramento. And of course, Underground Books for offering book sales for today's program. So let's get started. I'd like, a, like to welcome to the stage, Donna Apodoni. Donna Apodoni came to P Capital Public Radio in 1998. She has hosted Morning Edition since 2001, and it's hard to believe, but that really has been 20 years. She's hosted Cap Radio Re Reads events and podcasts since 2013. Donna works with the board of a national animal rescue organization and was several interfaith organizations. She is the author of Transformation, and teaches classes on how we can connect with our unique purpose in life while volunteering as a certified life coach and seminar facilitator. And she hosts our Authors Uncovered events. So welcome, Donna Apodoni. Thank you, Kathy. It's so nice to be here. I love this series. I love our libraries around this area, and I'm just delighted to be part of this. Janet, welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. And it's nice that we can join you in Paris this yes. evening. Yes, yes, it's really nice. Thank you, technology. I, I have to admit that when I was first told that we'd be doing this event and that you would be at your home in Paris, my first thought was, wow, where do I sign up for that? Where do I sign up to live in Paris? I think that would be lovely. <laughs> And it probably is, but I want to be also respectful of what's going on in the city that you live in right now. 
we have, I understand, according to BBC and NPR, some more cases of COVID cropping up in that area. So all the glitters is not necessarily mm -hmm. gold 100% mm -hmm. of the time. Before we start, respectfully to your environment, how is everyone in your circle doing? Uh, I think people are, the people I know are really, they've become homebodies. We don't really go out that much. And Paris has a 6 p.m. curfew. Uh, they're talking about a, th a third wave uh, of COVID and that there might be another confinement. I'm not sure if that will come to pass or not. Um, restaurants aren't open except for carry out. Um, and a lot of restaurants just remained closed. They just didn't want to stay open just for the, the lunchtime meal. Um, but yes, there are, I think the cases are rising here and the rollout for the vaccine has been really slow. Well, thanks for filling us in. And I know you have not been in, in any other year, you would spend part of your time in the US and have not been able to do that for the last year. But we have, even though our audience can't see them, we have the honor of having your parents as part of this event. They're part of the audience. We got to, I got to meet them a little bit earlier. So it's, it's nice that they can be part of this. Yes, I agree. This is the wonderful thing about technology is that we can we can still be together. We can talk face to face, even if we're not there in person. So uh, thank you so much for this wonderful event. Yeah, good. It's nice to nice to have the whole family here. I think you win the award for best planned back inside cover photograph of the author. There are a lot of good photographs of the authors on a lot of good uh, inside the back flap of a lot of books. But yours is especially creative because it is a library book. Yes, Atria was so creative. They did just such an amazing job on the book, on the end paper, on the cover. It just, it was just amazing. Everything that they did for the book is just gorgeous. It really is. And I thought, yeah, I just thought that was so clever and so original and, and such a lot of fun. To anybody who loves libraries, and that's why we're here, is going to mm -hmm. love this book. If you haven't already read it, by all means do. There are a lot of, there's a lot of library humor, probably a lot of library inside one liners that that librarians will get even more than I did as a, as a person who visits libraries all the time. And, and great jokes about the Dewey Decimal System too, just sort of a, a running, uh, I, I caught it, I saw it as a running gag, but it is a, a running sort of a, 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 a subplot there about that, which we'll talk about in a little while. But this is not just any library. This is the American Library in Paris. Tell us about that, that entity, that facility, that building. Well, the, the American Library in Paris uh, actually um, celebrated its centennial in 2020. And it started in 1920 and the library itself was born of war. It started when the American Library Association created its war service and sent a million books to servicemen in France. Uh, in, um, in camp libraries and in hospitals. And then those books after the war went to Paris and into what was called the Paris Library, which was a depot for books. And people in Paris wanted uh, a lasting library. And so they got together and uh, raised the funds for what is now the American Library in Paris. And one of the, one of the creators of the library was the father of Alan Seeger, Charles Seeger. Alan Seeger, I, I think we, we uh, many of us know um, Alan Seeger who wrote, I Have a Rendezvous with Death. It's been widely anthologized and it was one of John F. Kennedy's favorite poems. So his, um, Alan Seeger's father wanted to uh, create a, maybe a living monument to his son. And uh, we also had um, three female trustees of the American Library in Paris, which I don't think was very common at the time. There was Anne Morgan, the millionaire. There was Countess Clara de Chambrun, the Countess from Ohio, and the writer uh, Edith Wharton. So that's the beginning of the American Library in Paris. And then we, um, as readers, get to know the American Library in Paris just before World War II and during World War II. And so this is really the true story 
of the librarians and how they kept books safe, how they hand delivered books to their Jewish readers who could not go into the library at the time, could not go into public parks, could not have certain jobs. And there's a description of a librarian that I thought was priceless. You wrote it about a character named Boris, but I think it will amuse librarians and all of us who visit libraries. You said he was a librarian, part psychologist, bartender, bouncer, and detective. And in that one sentence, and that was just part of a larger sentence, in that one sentence, I think I think I pictured every librarian I've ever met in my life. You really captured the essence of what that job description is, depending on who we are and who we're dealing with there. Now, I'm curious to know about you, Janet, at what point you decided to write? What was the inspiration? When was that moment when you said, I'm going to be a writer? I've always been a, a writer. Um, maybe now I'm an author, but I've always been a writer. Uh, I started with my journal when I was 12, uh, observing people. I love to write letters. Um, it's something that I've always done. It's something that I've always done. And when did you realize that uh, an historic novel was going to be something that you would enjoy writing? Well, I don't know that I set out to, to write a historical novel. I just, I, I wanted to really write about these amazing librarians. I, I moved to Paris, I think in 1999, volunteered at the library, uh, was a member of the library and I didn't hear about the story at all until I worked there. And one of my very shy colleagues was talking to another colleague who was asking questions. And that's when I heard the story. That, um, that colleague has worked at the library since the Nixon administration. Uh, he's an Italian named Simon Gallo. And uh, he is just, you know, he's the living memory of the library. He knows everything about the library, but he's, he's very shy. He works in the back office. You'll never see him. Um, you'll never hear his voice. So um, it's always the shy ones in the back office who yes, know the good secrets they always about know. the place, yes, right? They always know. Yes. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the characters. And of course, the library is one of the characters. I don't want to overlook that. But as far as some of the human characters go, <laughs> there is a, a young woman. We meet her as, as a kid, really, uh, as a very young woman. Her name is Lily. She lives in Montana, grew up in Montana, as you did, right? Mm -hmm. OK. There is a woman named Odile, who I think of, in a way, as two characters, because we meet her at two parts of her her life. We meet the very young and idealistic Odile in Paris um, when she's, I guess, in her 20s. And then we also get to know her as a woman in Montana 50 years later, 40 years later, as an adult with a totally different sort of a personality and perspective on life. So before we go any further, tell us a little bit about, about Odile. Well, Odile, um, I guess I can say that I always wanted to write about a war bride because I grew up next to a war bride and I just think they are fascinating characters. I just am in awe of how brave they were to really leave everything behind. Um, and uh, so I think that's part of the, the inspiration. I knew I would write about a war bride. So I knew that Odile would end up in Montana when I, was, when I started the book. Um, I, uh, for physically Odile, she has a bob and she has hennaed hair. And there was a bookseller here in Paris named Odile Hellier. And she had a bookshop called The Village Voice on Rue Princesse, Princess Street. Uh, and uh, she just was such a wonderful, wonderful bookseller. She loved American and English authors and uh, she just had the best bookshop. She started the bookshop when she was 40. She retired when she was 70 um, and she just had all the greats in her, in her bookshop. And so physically that's who I was thinking of when I, when I wrote the book and that's how I pictured her. And then Odile, I just, um, her character, I just thought of, you know, someone who's young and all the doors are still open. That's such an exciting time to write about, you know, when you're 19, 20 years old and all the doors are still open. It's really a wonderful, wonderful thing. When we meet the young Odile, she is 
it's 1939. She, I think she's fairly fresh out of school, right? Yes. And she's a working woman. I mean, in 1939, there were mixed feelings about women who were employed, weren't there? There were, in fact, uh, she would have needed her father's permission or her husband's permission I, until 1938. I think that was absolutely necessary in France. And heaven knows her father tried to marry her off with quarters he, that he brought into the house all the time. Well, kind I think, of a fun I think, series of visitors that you introduce us to. Well, I think people view marriage as stability. I don't always think it is, but I think it, it has that has that kind of view that um, I think he just wanted her to be safe and to be happy. When she got that job at the library, she did her homework. And that's where the Dewey Decimal System kicks in as a, as a subject within the book. She memorized those numbers. She really did her homework, but she was very young. She was very naive. It seems like she really grew up in a very short time in that library because of the people who were around her. Well, she was really lucky that she had some really wonderful colleagues. She had some really wonderful um, regulars who came to the library every day. And yes, yeah, she, she formed some great friendships. And the, I want to call her the old Odile, but the more mature Odile, um, who we get to know off and on through the book, because the this is not a chronological book. We're going back and forth in time in this. It's the late 1980s. Odile, this well put together Parisian woman, as so many women in Paris are, she looks just so. And she is in Montana. She, people know she is a war bride. But other than that, she's kind of a mystery to her neighbors. How do they see her? I think they view her as just, you know, a foreign entity. And uh, I actually, when I started writing this book, it was called The War Bride, and there were 30 more pages about Odile's arrival in Montana. And when I was re researching uh, war brides, uh, I went to the Montana Historical Society and they had several um, they had several manuscripts of, uh, well, transcripts of interviews that journalists had done with war brides. And so what I learned was, was that the war brides were maybe seen as stealing a hometown sweetheart. A lot of men were killed during the war. There were maybe more women than men. And there was a, a lot of resentment towards these foreign women who really um, were seen to, to be stealing a, a hometown sweetheart. So uh, it was very hard for these women, um, very hard for these women. And so Odile suffered that same kind of hardship. I think her in-laws referred to her as, as ordeal um, rather than Odile, just to, just to say how hard it was for her. And at the time that we get to know Odile in the, in the 1980s in Montana, uh, she is not married. She's, she's a widow, so she was a war mm -hmm. bride, but, but we know her after that marriage. She and young Lily get to be friends. They live next door to each other. What do they see in each other? Why are they so intrigued with each other? I think for Lily, she just sees nothing of the outside world. I know when I was growing up, and MTV had just started and we didn't have MTV and I was dying just to be able to watch MTV or at least know what it was, but instead we had reruns of Little House on the Prairie. Um, so um, now I'm fine with Little House on the Prairie. I think that's better <laughs> than MTV. But at the time, you know, you just, you feel like there's something out there and you want to see it and you don't know what it is. So I think that Odile was the embodiment of everything else and everywhere else for Lily. And I think for Odile, I think she was a very prickly person, but you can't really be prickly with a kid. It's, uh, so she was maybe a little softer uh, with Lily, which allowed for an opening. She had a lot of patience with Lily. Yeah, you, you describe her as prickly and I see what you mean, but she showed amazing patience. There was a lot of teaching, I think on both sides. Yes, I think they were really lucky to have found each other. I think they really yeah. were. The town that you put them in, in Montana, mm -hmm. is just so filled with interesting meaning. Tell us about the town. 
The town is spelled F-R-O-I-D and it's pronounced froid in French, it means cold. And it's pronounced Freud in English like Sigmund Freud. And uh, um, my family has friends in Shelby, Montana, which is where we're from. And they have family in Freud. And I just thought it was the best name ever. And I wanted my Parisian character to, to, to end up in a town with a French name. And there are oh, a lot yeah. of towns, you know, like Cour d'Alene, Cour d'Alene. Um, mm. There are a lot of, of French towns through, throughout the United States. Isn't it funny we Americanize so many things and we forget that those are French names or, or names from a lot of other uh, countries outside of this one that we've just adopted and, and put our own stamp on. At the time that Odile, the mature Odile, and Lily meet each other, there's a lot going on in Lily's life. And, and I think it's it's almost like a grandmotherly sort of uh, an influence. And Lily's going through the death of her own mother and her father remarries and then there are little children in the house. And what a nice escape to go next door. And I noticed when they get together or they're signal to each other about, hey, you want to get together? They say a French lesson. And, and there's so much that happens under the guise of a French lesson. It's really an escape for both of them, isn't it? I think so. I think Odile probably finds pleasure in speaking her native language again and sharing her love of language with and love of li literature with Lily. I think the first book they read together is The Little Prince. Um, and then for Lily, it's that idea of foreignness and that idea of this outside world. And French is definitely a part of that for her. You grew up in Montana. Was it a small town? It was. I think it was population 2000 at the time. Okay. And you had the French neighbor, the woman who lived next yes, door she lived to two you? Blocks, two blocks down from us. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yes. And just very nice French teachers as well at, at my high school. So I really, I really loved uh, learning French. Was there that same kind of relationship? Is this mirroring something that you grew up with or did you extrapolate and expand on, on that? Well, I, I had my own family, my own grandmother um, when I was that age, but I think um, I really admired Claudine Maynard. She was really a, a lovely, lovely woman. I loved listening to her speak English. She had this lilting accent and I thought she sounded so much better than we did when we spoke English. We sounded rather plain. Um, and I just, you know, she just really did embody the outside world, just like my grandmother um, had jigsaw puzzles with the Dutch tulip fields, with the castles in Bavaria. So um, I just loved any hint of the outside world. So you fell in love with France early with other I did. people in your own community. I did, yes. Thanks to Claudine Maynard, I had that first interest in France. And then uh, my parents helped me go as an exchange student in, during the summer when I was 15. And then again, when I was 17 after I graduated. So uh, it was it was very lucky to be able to have those experiences. And you've lived there for how long? I've lived here. I, I came to France for one year. Uh, as a teaching assistant. The French government has a program for uh, recent college graduates where you can come here for a year and they want native English speakers um, in the classroom so they can hear the pronunciation and in exchange you have a work visa and uh, a job with not too many hours. So I came for one year and then I met my husband and I kept renewing my work contract and, uh, and we got married and that's a long-term contract. So <laughs> But like a lot of people, I came for one year. A lot of people do come for six months or one year and then really stay. And you're no longer, you're a fan of the library. You're affiliated as a, as a member. But you don't work there anymore, right? No, no. I worked there from 2010 to 2012. Okay. Yes. And you teach now? I taught until 2019. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. You remind me as you write about all of the scenes in the library, we just call it the library. You know, across America, after school, I'm going to the library. On yes. the weekend, I'm going to the library. And it doesn't matter what community we live mm -hmm. in or what branch we're going to, it's just the library. Mm -hmm. I had never really focused on that before reading this. Is that 
how it's known in France as well? Does it have sort of that little that little phrase attached to it? Well, for us, at, when I worked at the library, that's how we referred to it was the library. And it was a capital L. So it was definitely a capital L. Um, so, yes. Okay. And I, I want to get back to the the uh, the concept that you used uh, again, sort of the the running line about the Dewey Decimal System. Young Odile, as she's going for her interview, has all these little Dewey Decimal numbers running, the call numbers running in her head, and like everything she passes on the street reminds her of well, what number would that be? Trees. Oh, okay. You know, she she sort of and and I've I've. Uh, I've reimagined that a little bit as I'm telling it, but it's a, a constant throughout the story. It keeps coming back again. And there's one very interesting question that comes up about that. If a person had their own Dewey Decimal number, what would it be? So I have to ask you, what would your Dewey Decimal number be? I don't know because I don't <laughs> know the Decimal number. Oh, you're back. Uh, yes. I come and go and you come and go too, but I think that's okay. You know, it's a big ocean and every once in a while these things happen. Um, I know I came and went a little bit right now. I see that I'm the only person on the screen. So I think we may have lost touch with uh, Janet just momentarily. Um, if I'm wrong about that and if Janet can hear me, I think on my, um, on my PC, the code to refresh is F5. Um, and if anyone else from the tech crew needs to step in at this point, it would be a wonderful thing to have you uh, to have you pitch in. Oh, look, there's Kathy. <laughs> Hi, I figured I would join you. Not yes. least around yeah. here while Janet is figuring out her end of the tech thing. Right, right. And I'm sure so Stephen so... or somebody will be. I, I have a question for you because you, you have been reading this book the last yes. couple of days. So yes, let me I ask you. You know the Dewey Decimal System inside and out because you are with SAC Library. So even if you can't give me the number, do you know what category you would fit into? Okay, so first of all, I have not memorized oh, there the Dewey Decimal System. That must be something that they did back in the day. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Back. Janet's back. I was just asking Kathy the same question I asked you about what category she might fit into oh. in, in the Dewey Decimal System. So we were kind of I'm filling gonna... until you got back. Yeah, I'm going to answer that very quickly in that okay. it's funny, Donna, because that was the question I was going to ask Janet later in the Q&A if you did it, because I loved that part when they were going through it, but it really made me think about it. So while I get to think about it, Janet's going to answer, and then I am going to leave. <laughs> Boy, she got out of that one, didn't she, Janet? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and the way I posed it to her was, even if you don't know the number, what category might you fall into? And just about the time you were going to answer that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I, do like the, I think, is it fairy tales? Is it 317? I'm not sure. Um, I just, I like that category. Yeah. It was such a clever way to, to uh, let us know the inner workings of a library and to remind us that this was a unique location with its own language. The Dewey Decimal well, System is a language that we learn and we know how to find something, but we don't all necessarily think about it. It was unique in Paris at that time, wasn't it? Not, not everybody uses that system. It was, it really was unique. I think it started in Paris, probably in around 1920. There was a, there was a library um, in a suburb right outside of Paris called Le Valois Perret. 
and there was a, a library pioneer named Eugene Morel, Eugene Morel, who started the, using the Dewey Decimal System. And of course, he had to translate everything and, and, and recreate his own catalog. And so it was really, it, it really was, you know, almost 50 years later that they started using it in France. Wow. Wow. You talk a lot, you write a lot. Um, I hear your voice, I guess, when I'm reading. So that's why I said you talk a lot. You write a lot about the smell of books. And there's one particular part of the library that I just fell in love with, and apparently so do a lot of other people. Tell us about the afterlife. The afterlife, I think, I think Simone Gallo talked about the afterlife because there was a section in the library that was really this kind of old disused area where you know they kept the um the SAT preparation books from 1986 um or 1994 so it was a place that people didn't really go anymore um and I really liked going there when I needed just to take a break and I I, I wanted a quiet place I would I would go um to that to that and in Odile's time in young Odile's time what would she have found in the afterlife she would have found the same thing, kind of the disused books, the books that haven't been checked out in maybe five or 10 years, but maybe some someday someone would want to check them out. You never know what reference books people are going to want. So it's a way of making space on the shelves in the main part of the library, and, and but still making sure that Everything's everything was, was kept in yes. the building. You don't necessarily write a lot about the feel of books, but I am always so taken with the texture of books. And I, the cover of your book feels velvety to me. It just it, has this really beautiful texture to it. Do you have any choice as an author in what the page or the cover feels like? My editor, Trish Todd, sent me so many photos of different outfits, different colors, things like that. So she was very attentive and, and very, um, just wonderful about making sure that that I was happy with the cover. Yes. Good, good. I'm glad that you feel the same way about it. It's as much as people like to read on their devices, and I, I do that from time to time, there's something about a book that just feels so good, especially if it has that texture to it. I'm glad you were part of that um, selection. We have to talk about the war. It's a big part of this book. It's the reason you wrote the book because this building as a building, but also as an organization, as a library truly did have a big part in World War II. You write this story around the war, even though we get to know the other characters in, in other settings as well. Tell us about, and the director of the library was a real person, Dorothy Reader. I love the fact that her name is Miss Reader. It's not spelled as those of us who read. It's R-E-E-D-E-R, -E -E but what a happy coincidence. Yeah. Tell us about her and who she was in real life. Well, I'm thrilled to be able to talk about Dorothy Reader. I just think she's absolutely fabulous. She came to Paris alone in 1929. She got a job in the periodical section and worked her way up to the role of directress in 1936. And I, she's very diplomatic. I read hundreds of pages of her correspondence and she's dealing almost entirely with men. And so she lays out in her correspondence, this must be done, this must be done, this must be done. And she lays out all her brilliant ideas. And then at the end she's like, thinking of their, you know, their, um, their maybe ego. She's like, but of course you know best and you know what must be done. And so she really, I think she was really aware that she had to be diplomatic and she was so diplomatic and so, um, so appreciated and it, it really shines through her correspondence is absolutely gorgeous. I read a, what convinced me to write the book was a 15 page report, a confidential report that she wrote about the war. It's on my website, uh, jcharles.com. If you wanna read her report, it's very interesting. She talks about right before the, right before the arrival of the Nazis, her time uh, during the occupation, it is, it is just fascinating. It's just fascinating. And reading her words gave me the chills and I knew I had to write the story. If you had wanted to write this story, if anyone had wanted to write this story, 
10, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of these materials would not have been available. You came along with the interest at the right time. Well, it's true that thanks to technology, almost all of my documents came from, all of my documents about the American Library in Paris actually came from the American Library Association outside of Chicago. And so I asked them to scan the documents. And so they sent me, you know, they, they had a, uh, um, a librarian who scanned all the, all the pages. So it's true that um, I would have, you know, earlier, maybe I would have had to have gone, um, I have to say, I love to underline things. And so um, I don't know if I could have made photocopies um, at that time, but I really appreciated being able to um, have the have the the documents in my home and looking at them when I wanted to and how I wanted to, not being not not being um, not having to go there. Um, because if I had to go to all the places, I, I got information from Boise, I got information from Rhode Island, I got information from Washington, mm. D.C., New York, this book would have been a very expensive book to write. So thanks yeah. to technology. Yeah. Miss Reader, Dorothy Reader, uh, people who worked for her called her Miss Reader, so I kind of picked that up from them. Uh, she was an American. She was told to, leave, not asked, she was told, as many expats in Paris were at the time, told to leave twice. And eventually she left, but not when she was told to. She really had a mission to keep the library open. Why was that important to her and how did she go about it? She really believed uh, that books were bridges. And she, on the third, she just as you said, the American ambassador issued a letter to all Americans in Paris or all Americans in France telling them to leave in August of 1939. And she and the staff stayed at the library. Uh, the, one of the librarians, Helen Fickweiler, arrived only three days before war broke out. And so they all made the choice to stay. And then they, um, Miss Reader organized the soldier service to deliver books to English and uh, French soldiers during, uh, during World War II. So she sent 100,000 books uh, to the soldiers. And uh, the, there's a thank you note included in my novel, which was written by a British captain. And he'd actually been a recipient of books from the American Library.